It began with the creation of tabletop games. Warhammer 40k for sci-fi, Age of Sigmar for high fantasy, Star Wars X-Wing for spaceships. For within these game systems was a niche for all types of nerds, but they were all of them deceived. For another game system was made, in the corporate offices of Games Workshop, a master game was made, to be better than all others. And into this game, GW poured in strategy, tactics, simplicity, and the most balanced rule set. One game to rule them all. Welcome. I'm here to teach you all the basics of Games Workshop's Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, also known as MESBG. This game is often described as easy to learn and hard to master. After learning these basics, you'll be able to go to your local game store or play with a friend. Aside from the game models, the only other equipment you need to start playing is a ruler, a pack of dice, a surface to play on, and a love of Lord of the Rings. Once you get more familiar, you can look into getting painting accessories, regulation tables, and terrain. But those are just to make the experience more immersive, so totally optional at the start. If you're planning to play narrative scenarios, you can skip the army building step. But if you're interested in match play, which I very much recommend, army building will be the first step of playing MESBG. For match play, I recommend using the scenarios in the match play guide, as these scenarios have a wide variety of objectives and end conditions, which add a lot of strategy and prevents all your games from being a fight to the death every single game. As fun as that is, that gets old quickly. If you plan on playing in tournaments or just being part of the greater community and meeting other players, it makes it very easy to get on the same page as the match play scenarios are the universal go-tos in non-narrative games. I just wanted to take a second to shout out our Patreon. We have a growing library of extra videos and other perks. Link in the description. And thank you to all our patrons for supporting this channel. We truly appreciate every single one of you. Now, back to the video. Let's start by building an army for match play. Pick your favorite army from the Armies of Lord of the Rings or Armies of the Hobbit book. A great starting point would also be the Battle of Osgiliath starter pack or one of the battle host boxes for a great value iconic army. There are additional supplement books which contain special armies known as legendary legions, but those are optional and we won't get into those in this video. A typical points level for MESBG ranges from 500 to 800 points. Of course, there are some higher and lower outliers depending on your area. Looking at the profiles, you can see how each model costs a certain number of points. You want your army points total to be equal to or less than the total points determined in your game. Within each army, there are heroes and warriors to choose from, and many have additional equipment that can be purchased for the models individually for a number of points. Now, before you choose the profiles to use, there's a rule that warriors must be led by heroes, because obviously these grunts can't think for themselves. If you look at the hero profiles, you can see that they are tiered. Legend, Valor, Fortitude, Minor, and Independent. Each tier determines how many warriors they can lead, with Legend tier being able to lead the most warriors, an independent tier not being able to lead at all. So, with respect to that rule, you may now mix and match any number of heroes and warriors for your army, as long as the total points do not exceed the number agreed upon by your opponent or local tournament organizer. One other side note, for most armies, there is an additional restriction to follow. You may not have more than one third of your army armed with bows, why, you might ask? Well, pro tip, bows are very good in this game. You may also mix and match different armies from different factions, although there are certain restrictions to this. If you wish to do this, check out the Alliance Matrix and Rules on Hero Restrictions in the Rules Manual 
and Games Workshop FAQ found on their website. Now that you have your army built, let's get into the gameplay. A game is made up of a series of turns until an end condition is met, and each turn is made up of different phases. Most of the time, the game will end when one army is under 50% or 25% of the starting model count. This will be clearly stated in the particular scenario you are playing. Each turn is made up of five phases, priority, move, shoot, fight, and end. Every turn starts with priority, which essentially is just a d6 dice roll off between the players. The player with the highest roll will win priority for the turn and get to act first throughout that whole turn. If there is a tie, it goes to the player who did not have priority the previous turn. Next is the move phase, which is a very important phase. The general order of operations is the player with priority that turn will move all their models first. After that player has finished, then the player who lost priority will move all their models. Each model's maximum movement can be found on their profile. And yes, models may choose to move less than max distance if they so wish. Models can even choose to stay still, though that is incredibly cowardly. Once a model moves into base contact with an enemy model, they are considered being in combat, and the charge model can no longer move, even if they have not been activated yet this turn. Any model that is not in combat has a control zone of 1 inch, which is kind of like their threat range. If any enemy model enters that zone, they must charge into combat with that model. After both players have had a chance to move all their models individually, then you may proceed to the next phase. The next phase is shooting. This will matter more for certain armies compared to others. The player with priority this turn, similar to the move phase, would again shoot first. One at a time, models with shooting weapons may activate. Note, there are certain restrictions depending on the weapon. For most shooting weapons, the rule is being able to move up to half of the model's maximum distance and still being able to shoot. However, there are weapons that state the model may not shoot this turn if they have moved at all. While some weapons allow shooting, even if the models have moved their full distance. If the shooting model is eligible, pick a target within the weapon's range and line of sight of the model, which means pretending you are seeing out of your model's eyeball and making sure it can see their target. You then roll a d6 to see if the model hits. Each profile will have a shoot value, which is the minimum threshold for the hit roll. For example, Legolas has a three plus which means he needs to roll a three or higher to hit the target. If the shooting model has moved that turn and is still allowed to shoot, the shooting value becomes worse by one. So in this case, Legolas would need a four or higher to hit. If there are any objects or other models in the way of the target, you will have to roll an in the way check. For most cases, it's a 50-50, on a d6 dice, on a 1 to 3, it hits the unintended obstacle, and on a 4 to 6, it bypasses the obstacle going towards the correct target. Now, on to the fun part. Once a target is hit, check your shooting weapon's strength value and the target's defense value on the profiles, and then go to the wound table. Using both values, determine what you need to roll to inflict a wound on a d6 die. If you successfully wound the target, and the target model only has one wound, then they are removed instantly from the game as a casualty. Kill confirmed. Once all eligible models on both sides have shot, you may proceed on to the fight phase. The fight phase is unique in the sense that there is no taking turns between the players. All fights are fought with participation on both ends. The player with priority, however, does determine which combats are resolved first, as well as pairing off which models are fighting in the case that a model is in base-to-base -base with several different enemy models. 
There is a rule that players must do their best to pair off as many one-on-ones as possible. So priority is still an advantage in fight phase. Nice. To begin a combat, check your model's attack value first, as this is how many d6 dice you may roll in this combat. If you have two models with one attack in this combat, you may roll two dice. The player with their models having the highest roll would win this combat. In the case of a tie, check the highest fight value of all the models on your side, and the highest fight value would win the tied roll. If the fight values are equal, it then becomes a 50-50 roll off. Once the fight is won, the losing models must back up one inch. Up to one friendly model may also back up to one inch to provide space if needed. If the losing model is unable to back away, they are determined as trapped and will take double strikes. The winning model or models would then strike at the losing model or models, similar to shooting. You would check the winning model's strength value and compare it to the losing model's defense value on the wound chart and then roll and take wounds accordingly. Keep in mind a model rolls as many dice as it has attacks for both winning the fight and striking to wound. There are different kinds of weapons and special rules for the different types of warriors and heroes and they provide buffs to parts of this fighting process, but that is beyond the scope of this video and you won't need it for the basic gameplay. Next, resolve all combats until all models on both sides are no longer base to base. Once everything is resolved, you may proceed to the end phase, which for the most part, nothing happens unless there is a special rule on a model that requires a check here. You can, for the most part, ignore this part. With that, a full turn is complete and you may now go back to priority and rinse and repeat until a red sun rises. Now that all the basics are covered, it's time to add a bit of complexity and fun. One of the most important parts of MESBG is the heroes. It's a big reason why we were all interested in the Lord of the Rings, right? All heroes have the special ability to alter the sequence of the various phases and even save you from unlucky dice rolls. On each hero's profile, you will notice an additional row of stats, might, will, and fate. These are the hero's limited resources, which can be used up during the course of the game. Let's work backwards, starting with fate, and leave might for last, as it's the most complex, but also the most interesting. Whenever your hero takes a wound, you may use a fate point to roll a d6. On a four or higher, the fates intervene and your hero does not take the wound. Will has several more niche uses that resolve around more advanced play, so we aren't going too in depth with it in this video. But the following are some of the most common uses for will points. Spellcasters use will to attempt to cast spells. Models targeted by spellcasters may use will to resist and will may also be used to pass courage tests. Certain times in a game, a model will be required to take a courage test. Each model has a courage value on its profile. So to take a courage test, simply roll two d6 dice and add your courage value. If the total of the three numbers are 10 or greater, then you pass the courage test. Depending on the situation, there are different consequences to failing a courage test. Such as when charging a terrifying model, you must pass a courage test before charging in, and if the model fails, they may not move for that turn. Courage tests are also required by every model, every single turn, after half of their starting army are dead. This is considered as broken. And if models fail this courage test, they flee the battle and count as a casualty. Heroes can not only use will points to boost up their courage test rolls, but also 
call a stand fast, which means after they pass and finish their move, warrior models within six inches of the hero count as automatically pass the, the broken force courage test. Now, for might points. This one has so many uses. The most straightforward use of might is altering a dice roll. A hero may use one or more might points to alter their own dice rolls by one or more. For example, Bormir rolls three dice because he has three attacks to try to win a fight against an orc. He only rolls a four high, whereas the orc rolls a six. Bormir may use two points of might to change his four roll into a six, and Bormir would then take the tie as he has a higher fight compared to the orc, and then he may proceed on to striking. Might points can also be used to call heroic actions. Different heroes will have access to different heroic actions, some of which will boost their speed, fighting stats, or defensive abilities but these won't be covered in this video. You can see which hero has which heroic actions in their profile. However, I will speak on the heroic actions that all heroes have access to, and perhaps the best heroic actions. All heroic actions must be declared at the beginning of their corresponding phases before any models have been activated. The first one we're gonna cover is heroic move. If you have lost priority, any of your heroes have the opportunity to use a might point to call a heroic move at the start of the move phase. This allows the hero and all friendly models within six inches to move first, even before the player with priority. The restrictions are that the hero that calls this action must move first and all other models that are activated in this six inch bubble must stay within six inches at the end of their move. If these models in the starting bubble cannot do that, they may not move at all during that turn. Naturally, if you call heroic move, your opponent may wish to counteract that with their own heroic move. This will then come down to a 50-50 roll off to see which player's heroic activates first. And if a hero that has a pending heroic move is charged, it is immediately cancelled. This action gives the player that lost the priority roll to still have an opportunity to take initiative, or at least burn the opponent's resources by forcing them to counter call. Next, at the beginning of the shoot phase, a heroic shoot may be called. Very similar to heroic move, using a might point for this allows the hero and six inches of surrounding models to jump the queue on priority and shoot first. Finally, we have my favorite action, the heroic combat, to be declared at the beginning of the fight phase. Heroic combats resolve first before any other combats. And if multiple heroic combats are called, again, a 50-50 roll off will occur to determine which player goes first. A hero combat successfully activates if the hero model that called it and any friends in the same combat successfully kills all enemy models they are in combat with. If this happens, the hero and any other models in the combat may move, charge, and even fight in another combat this turn. This will allow the strongest heroes to tear through hordes of enemy models each turn. With this knowledge, you should now be able to play a full game of MESVG against a friend or a stranger seamlessly. Now winning is a different story. Great success. If you'd like to do that, you should watch our other videos. Don't worry about not knowing all the rules perfectly. Even the most knowledgeable veterans I know will check the rules several times each tournament. The most important thing is to start playing and having fun. I hope this guide was useful, and if you'd like more tutorial videos, let us know below. Until next time.